where we are this morning as we begin a new lesson. We're going to look at verses 6 through 26 this morning in the first chapter of Philippians as we make our way through it in our series, Always Rejoicing. And this church here at Philippi that Paul is writing this letter to, remember Paul's writing this letter from prison in Rome. And so this church at Philippi, this is a strong church, it's a fruitful church, but Paul didn't want them to become apathetic or unproductive. And so uh, the Christian life throughout Scripture is described as a growing relationship with Christ. And we'll look at some verses throughout the New Testament that speak of that. Um, and so in these verses that we'll examine this morning, Paul is going to challenge these believers in Philippi with some spiritual goals. And each time that Paul returned to these believers, his desire was to find them growing in a closer relationship with Christ and accomplishing more things for the glory of God. And so in our lives, we're going to see this morning that setting goals spiritually is important if we're going to accomplish something for God. Uh, we have to make sure that the goals that we set in our lives are what God wants for us, not just our own, uh, own agenda. We remember uh, Jesus praying, uh, not my will, but thy will be done. And so that's a good model for our lives as well. We don't want to just have goals for the sake of having goals or having our own goals, but if we have goals that we set in life, we want to make sure that our goals are the goals that God wants. And so what is the goal that God has for every single believer? Well, number one, to become less and less like the world and more and more like His Son, Jesus Christ, right? Uh, that's what God wants for us. Uh, Paul wrote in the book of Romans, a verse that many of us are familiar with, uh, he says... Uh, in Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And it'd be kind of hard to improve on perfect, wouldn't it? So this morning, uh, we'll, we'll look at several different things. We'll find, we'll continue talking about joy this morning and find how these believers, how Paul was able to rejoice through certain circumstances. We'll see this morning that as believers, we should r rise above mediocrity uh, in life and that many times is prevalent, even in Christian circles. And we ought to strive for excellency for Christ. We'll see this morning that God's plan is always a good plan. And it will yield blessings to us if we follow. We talked about that through our first two weeks in this series, that when we obey God, when there's consistent obedience, that there's blessings that follow because of it. And that even though things in our lives may not always seem to be the best for us, that the circumstances may not be the best, if we're aware that God's ways are what's best, even though the circumstances may not seem the best, we'll realize that He'll always work things out for His glory and our benefit if we trust Him. Uh, when you were a kid, any of you ever remember saying, you know, when I, when I grow up, I want to be such and such? Joey, did you, when you were a kid, was there something that you wanted to be when you grew up? I to be an, engineer. an engineer. That's right. Um, when I was a little kid... I wanted to grow up to be a garbage man. I could still have, I have lived that dream. I, I was a garbage man for a while at a factory. Um, wasn't near as fun as what I thought it would be when I was a kid. But I, I guess I always liked seeing the garbage men hanging on the back of the truck. And so, you know, I wanted to grow up to be a garbage man right on the back of a garbage truck. And so, you know, when I was a kid at the grocery store, I'd hang on the back of the grocery cart. And uh, I got to pretend that I was a garbage man riding the garbage truck. Uh, but then as I got older, you know, my desires kind of changed and my, my elevations kind of grew. So I went from wanting to be a garbage man to eventually as I got older, I decided I want to be president of the United States. And so, I mean, why not? Let's be a garbage man and president, you know. Uh, what a great story. But we could all, you know, probably talk of things that we wanted to be when we were younger. And, you know, for most of us, we don't grow up to be those things, you know. I, I heard of one guy... Uh, one preacher, he said when he was young, you know, they were talking about that. He heard his sisters talking about it, and he said, I was about four years old, and he said, when I grow up, I want to be a fire truck. And uh, he said, they started laughing at me and making fun of me because I said I wanted to be a fire truck. He said, I guess I didn't realize the difference between a fire truck and a fireman, you know. Um, but he said, thankfully, I didn't grow up to be a fire truck. Well, you know, uh, 
I'm grateful that God's called me to be in the ministry. We could echo the words that Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 1.12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Uh, and so there's a specific goal in our lives, but there's a general goal that God has for each believer. Uh, Revelation 4.11. This, this is one of God's goals for mankind. Revelation 4.11. He says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. So God created us, and it's His desire that our lives bring glory to Him. That was the purpose of God creating us. Uh, you know, 1 Corinthians 10.31, it says, Whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, do all to the glory of God. And anything less than the perfect will of, uh, of God in our lives will cause us to fall short of His goal for us. In the book of Colossians, Epaphras, he prayed in the book of Colossians that we may stand perfect and complete in the will of God. And so that ought to be our goal and our desire every single day in life that we are completing God's goals in our lives. And we talked about that in our last series. But first this morning, as we get into these verses, uh, verse 6 through verse 11, we're going to look at an approved excellence. And we'll get to this here in a few minutes, but in verse number 10, you know, he says that you may approve things that are excellent. And that's a good goal, things that are excellent. Many times we settle for things that are mediocre in our lives. And many times excellence will get reduced to acceptable, and then acceptable gets lessened to adequate. Before we know it, you know, we're just a step away from mediocre. He says, approve unto things that are excellent. Here's kind of an interesting, an interesting thing. According to a researcher named Natalie Gabal, if 99.9% were just good enough, I mean, that's, that's pretty good, right? 99.9%. If that were good enough, two million documents would be lost by the IRS every single year. Twelve babies would be given to the wrong parents in hospitals. 291 pacemaker operations would be performed incorrectly. 20,000 drug prescriptions would be incorrectly written. 114,500 mismatched pairs of shoes would be shipped to stores. That's if 99.9% .9 of everything was good enough. Well, I don't know about you, but you know, when we talk about 291 pacemaker operations being performed incorrectly, if you're going to get a pacemaker installed, wouldn't you want to know that you had a doctor that was going to do it correctly? Is just good enough? Is 99.9% .9 good enough? Good enough? God deserves the very, the very best from our lives, doesn't he? Not just mediocre, not just good enough, but we should strive for excellency. I mentioned this song last week, and it fits, it fits well again this morning, the song, uh, Our Best, that we sing sometimes. Here's the, the first verse and the chorus. It says, Hear ye the Master's call, give me thy best. For be it great or small, that is his test. Do then the best you can, not for reward, not for the praise of man, but for the Lord. Every work for Jesus will be blessed, but he asks from everyone his best. Our talents may be few, these may be small, but unto him is due our best, our all. Amen. Now notice with me first, as we get here into these first few verses this morning, I want you to realize that we serve a consistent God. We serve a consistent God. We're going to talk about these inspirational goals that Paul has when we first notice we serve a consistent God. Verse number 6. Paul says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now we live in a time period that we call postmodern. We, we live in a postmodern society in its thinking. It, meaning that today, truth has been declared relative. You know, there's no absolutes. What's right for you may not be right for me. What's wrong for me may not be wrong for you. 
you know, but as long as I believe it to be true, that's okay. Just kind of a sliding scale. There's no definitive right or wrong. A postmodern society. And, you know, Paul warned Timothy, you know, 2,000 years ago that this would happen. And, you know, remember he said there would come a time when people would not endure sound doctrine and they'd heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And, of course, we know that their ultimate goal, and we can see this especially in the year 2020, right? We can see the ultimate goal is to eliminate the ultimate absolute. They're not just going after absolute truths of this and that, but the ultimate absolute is God himself, right? That's what we'd like to eliminate in our society. In the book of Romans, you know, Paul wrote that, that they would change the truth of God into a lie and they worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. So if man can eliminate God then man has eliminated any sort of accountability which allows man to become his own God. And then I can live however I please. And I get to make the rules of what's right and what's wrong. I can live any way I want to. And it's easier to stop believing in God than it is to stop sinning. You know, in the book of John... John 3, 19 and 20, it says, This is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. So mankind would just rather get rid of God than to change the way mankind lives. On page 211, of the book Beyond Good and Evil, German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Here's what, here's what this German philosopher wrote. Truth and value are on a sliding scale with no absolute standard. The philosopher of absolute truth is prejudiced by the presupposition that there are opposites like true and false, good and evil. Now, Sorry, Mr. Nietzsche, but some of us don't want to live our lives on a sliding scale. You know, we may be prejudiced, as he says, but some of us choose to believe in a God that does not change. He's absolute. The book of Malachi still says, For I am the Lord, I change not. And we still believe that in the book of Hebrews, you know, it says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So... What he says about truth being on a sliding scale, that's contrary to the Word of God, isn't it? Man. Now, politics, it may change. Politics may be on a sliding scale. Morals, they may be on a sliding scale. Ethics may be on a sliding scale. Religions may be on a sliding scale. They're constantly changing. Ethics, all of these things, they're constantly changing. But God remains the same. He hasn't changed. The book of Psalms says... Thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. He doesn't change. So we're talking about we serve a consistent God. That's right. That's right. Paul begins here in this verse by talking about we serve a consistent God. And then really what he's saying in this verse is that what God started in our lives at salvation. Let's go back and look at verse number 6 again so that way we don't forget what we're reading. Being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So what he began in our lives at salvation, he's going to finish in our lives at glorification. 
You know, in the next chapter of Philippians, in chapter 2, we're told that God continues to work in us through His Spirit. Warren Wiersbe, he, he put it this way. He said, the work of God through salvation is a threefold work. He says, first, the work that God does for us, that's salvation. The work that God does in us, sanctification. And the work that God does through us, which is service, the works that we do. And so this work, Paul's writing here, he says, this is going to continue in your lives until we see Christ. And then the work will be fulfilled. You remember in 1 John 3, 2, it says, We shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. That day in glory, the work in our lives will be completed. And it was a source of joy in Paul's life. We're talking about always rejoicing. It was a source of joy in Paul's life to know that God was still working in the lives of these believers here at Philippi. He's, he's, He's thanking God for this. And after all, you know, the the basis of real joyful Christian fellowship is to have God at work in our lives every single day. You want to experience joy in life and always be able to rejoice, then knowing that we serve a consistent God and knowing that He's working in us, if we're staying close to Him, if we're growing in Him, which takes us into the next thing we're going to talk about this morning, but we know that God is at work in our lives, that'll produce joy. Many times people say, you know what, I just, God doesn't feel very close to me. I don't feel very close to God. And many of us have probably experienced those feelings at some point in our lives. And when we don't feel like we're in a close relationship with God, many times we don't feel very joyful in life either. Why? Because there's something in that relationship that's missing. We don't feel God working. We we don't, and many times it's not God's fault. He wants to work in our lives. It's because we have drawn away from God. We've pulled away. And so we may not feel joy in our lives. We may not not be experiencing joy in our lives because we don't see the evidence of God working. So we keep our relationship with God close and know that we serve a consistent God and that He wants to work in us. And yeah, we may not be perfect today or tomorrow or 50 years from now, but every single day we're growing a little bit and we're getting closer to God and we know that the work of God will be completed the day that we meet Jesus Christ. And so then we go to verse number 7 where we see that that as believers, not only do we serve a consistent God, but we strive for continuous growth. That's what we were just talking about. Paul says, Even as it is meet for me to think this of you, because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense of the confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace... Verse number 8, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Verse number 9, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all uh, judgment. Paul says here that, that the Philippians had him in their hearts, and he has them in his heart. And you know, that was probably the secret of Paul's great prayer life. When we begin to think about the people that we pray for the most, typically turn out to be the people that we love the most. And the prayer list that causes us to want to pray the most are the ones that we have in our hearts. And Paul says here, he says, you know, the Philippians, they have me in their hearts, I have them in my heart. He loves them. We see that word bows there. That means, you know, that uh, the deepest innermost part of our affection. He loves them from way down deep inside. In between what God has done in our lives at salvation and what He's going to ultimately finish in our lives at glorification, He desires that we grow. Let's look at verse number 9 again. How did Paul put it? That we may abound yet more and more. That's growth. Abounding more and more. Paul wants to see these believers grow in the sanctification stage. It's a gradual change. We get grow more and more and more. This is ongoing in our lives. After the radical change of salvation that happens instantly, we grow closer and closer and closer to God. You know, Peter wrote that we should grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're to grow. And so Paul prays here that the Philippians would love without any kind of limits, 
that their love would abound more and more. Now, Paul has received, he's received uh, enough proof that they love him. But Paul's saying, you know what? There's a whole world of people out there, church at Philippi, that you need to love. Yeah, you love me, but now it's time to love the rest of the world. The, the men that own the, uh, the poor demonic slave girl needed to be loved. The city magistrates that had unjustly beaten Paul and Silas needed to be loved. These Philippian believers, they had neighbors, friends, workmates, acquaintances, relatives, other brothers and sisters in Christ who needed to be loved with the love of Christ. And Paul says, my prayer is that your love will abound, will grow more and more and more, and that you'll show the love of God to more and more people. In our lives, we can never become satisfied with where we're at in our spiritual height. We mentioned that a couple weeks ago. We can never get to the point where we feel like we have reached perfection. Because we can look at we can look around at somebody else and say, well, you know what? I think I have exceeded past them. But that's not our goal in life, is it? Jesus Christ is our goal. And we're never going to measure up to that, are we? While we're here on earth. That's that process that Paul's talking about, that work that he's begun in us, that he will one day accomplish when we reach glory. When it comes to spiritual growth, we remember these words from the book of Ephesians, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye be rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of of God. And then we seek a celestial goal. We serve a consistent God. We strive for continuous growth. Now we're going to seek a celestial goal, verse 10 and verse 11. What does he say? That ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Becoming like Christ is impossible without His help. We can't do it in our own strength. We can't do it in our own power. You want to find joy in life? You've got to do it with God's help. Try to do it on our own strength? We're not going to find it. What does Paul write in the book of 2 Corinthians? Chapter 3, verse number 5, what does he say? Not that we... Have we got it? Is that verse in here? 2 Corinthians 3, 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is what? Of God. Our goal is to mature into the likeness of the Savior. Paul prays that these believers, that they would mature in their Christian service, in their Christian works. He wanted them to be filled. He wanted them to be fruitful, he says, in those verses that we just read in verse 10 and verse 11. It kind of reminds us of the verses from the book of John where we talk about Jesus as the vine. He says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except to divide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. Now, he wants these believers in Philippi to be fruitful, producing fruit. Too many Christians, though, try to produce fruit in their own efforts. And that doesn't happen, does it? Jesus says that we're to abide in him. For without him, we can do nothing, he says in the book of John. So what is this fruit? Paul wants these believers in Philippi to be fruitful. Well, what, is, what does that mean? What, is, what does he want? Well, I think back to our series that we did last year, maybe it was the year before, on fruit. Bushels of fruit. Well, we know that God wants to see the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. You remember Paul wrote about that in the book of Galatians. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. 
God wants to see those fruits in our lives. Paul wanted to see those fruit in the lives of those believers at Philippi. So he wants that. He wants to see Christian character that glorifies God. That's where we began this morning. Whatsoever we do, do all to the glory of God. We were created for God's pleasure and for God's glory. Paul compares uh, winning lost souls to Christ to bearing fruit in the book of Romans. He names holiness as a spiritual fruit, Romans 6.22. We're talking about fruit that Paul and ultimately God wants to see in each of our lives. And then he says, be fruitful in every good work. And then the writer of the book of Hebrews, whom I believe to be Paul, he wrote that our praise, the praise, the thanksgiving that we give to God, he calls it the fruit of our lips. So there's a lot of fruit that, that should be evident in our lives. Now when the fruit tree begins to produce fruit. Have you ever noticed a fruit tree making a bunch of noise about the fruit it produces? Oh, they don't really make any noise, do they? It just allows the life within it to work in a natural way, and the fruit is a natural byproduct of that work. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Are you like Jesus in your life? You know, when we're bearing fruit, when, when those things are coming in our lives that he just talked about, the fruit of the lips, uh, winning souls to Christ, the fruit of the Spirit, all those different things, holiness, when those things begin to produce in our lives, we don't have to make a bunch of noise, we don't have to strive to do it. When our relationship, when we're growing, that was the, that was the first step when we're growing in our relationship with Christ, like a fruit tree, it just is going to naturally produce and be evident. You know, as we think about, are we like Jesus? The book of Acts tells us that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, that was a great compliment. It wasn't intended to be a compliment to them, but it was. The early followers of Jesus Christ were called Christ-like by those who were observing their lives, who were watching their actions. And it causes us to ask the question, when people see our lives, do they see Christ in it? Are we exemplifying Christ? And the difference between spiritual fruit and human religious activity, is there's a difference, is that Fruit is going to bring glory to Jesus Christ. But whenever we do anything in our own strength, if we feel like, man, look at what I've accomplished, we're going to start trying to make a bunch of noise about it. We're going to try to get everybody's attention. Hey, look at what I've done. And then are we bringing glory to Jesus Christ? Are we accomplishing his goal for our lives when we do that? No. The glory must go to God alone. We can't try to claim the credit. Now, often our flesh... It doesn't want to act or react Christ-like. That's hard to do sometimes. But God, through His Word, can change us to become like Him. Next, verse 12 through 14, we're going to see an appointed experience. And this is where it really starts to get good this morning. It's comforting to know that God is in charge of everything in our lives from the beginning to the end. Every step in between. From our first breath to our final breath, God is in complete control. I love what it says in Psalm 37, 23. Psalm 37, 23 tells us this. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. So not only are the destinations of life ordered, but according to this verse, every single step we take is ordered and directed by God. It's carefully and lovingly planned out as part of God's construction for our lives. So that would mean then that whatever happens in our life, God doesn't make mistakes, right? We know that God doesn't make mistakes. 
He's not going to start making mistakes with our lives. So whatever happens between the first of our life and the end of our life, God has planned out in the steps that we take. In Paul's life, nothing happened by accident. Now keep in mind, where is Paul writing this book from? Prison in Rome. All the varied threads of circumstances in Paul's life, they were being woven together by God into a pattern that would result in God's glory. Because remember where we began this morning, Revelation 4.11? God created us for His pleasure and for His glory. And everything in our lives will happen for a reason. God allows it to happen. The circumstances, when we look at them, we may think, man, this is not the best circumstance. Being in prison, we, we look at Paul's life and think, man, being in prison, that's not the best circumstance. But God was weaving these threads together that would result in his eternal praise. I like how one poet wrote it. Here's what he said. Not till each loom is silent and the shuttles cease to fly shall God reveal the pattern and explain the reason why. The dark threads were as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver for the pattern which he planned. God was weaving all of these things in Paul's life together for a purpose. You know, the Bible still says in Romans 8, 20 to 8, that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Do we have that verse? Yes. We know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. That's still in the Bible. So are you willing to take from God's hand anything that He chooses to give to you? Are you able to look into the eyes of God with love and with trust and even thanksgiving, knowing that He planned what is happening? He's, he's using the threads. It doesn't matter how much delight or how much pain something brings to our lives, but we're willing to take it simply because God gives it to us. Because we'll see here in verse number 12 that Paul's troubles, it produces a bigger influence. Verse number 12. Paul says, But I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. Now, Paul wanted to go to Rome. Paul wanted to get to Rome so bad. But Paul wanted to go to Rome as a preacher. Not as a prisoner. But that's how Paul got there. He got there in chains. And Paul could have written a long letter to these people in Philippi about all of the experiences of the bad things that happened to him. But Paul didn't do that. Instead, Paul sums it up as the things which happened unto me. Now, you can go into the book of Acts, Acts 21 through Acts 26, and Luke records all of the things which happened unto me that happened in the life of Paul. So you can go and read all of these things that happened to Paul, and there's a lot of things that happened to Paul. But Paul doesn't go into any of that. Paul just, man, he sums up a lot of pages of Scripture by saying the things that happened unto me. Everyone in life, everyone desires the mountaintop experiences of the Christian life. We all want to be on top of the mountain, right? Let me show you a quick video here. Took this uh, year before last in Rocky Mountain National Park. Here we are. We're at 14,000 feet elevation. And it's beautiful up on top of Rocky Mountain National Park as you drive through it. It's the highest continuous paved road in North America. We're up at over 14,000 feet. I mean, it's just incredible to be up there on top of the mountain like this. But as we spin around here and look, someone was trying to get away from the, uh, from the camera as we spin around, but we finally got her in there. But you notice something about this video on top of the mountain? We all want to be on top of the mountain. There's not much growing on top of the mountain, is there? 
<laughs> There's nothing there. Nothing grows on top of a mountain. I mean, as you drive up the mountains, you see the tree line at about 10,000, 11,000 feet. You just see a, a line as you look across the mountaintops where everything stops growing. Growth always takes place in the valley. Growth takes place in the valley. Fred Beck said it this way, the brook would lose its song if you removed the rocks. You ever like to listen to the sound of a, of a creek running? But you take the rocks out of it, and there's no song anymore. The trials of life, they are always God-filtered. Everything that comes into our lives are filtered through the hands of God. So we always want to put Him between us and our circumstances. The Apostle Paul, he certainly went through his fair share of trials and troubles. And he, he mentions it in a few verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, in about five verses, he mentions some of the things that he went through. But you know what? Paul came to the realization of this, that problems are opportunities in work clothes. Problems are opportunities in work clothes. Paul did not find his joy in ideal circumstances. We have well established, Paul's established, other writers of the Gospels have established that Paul did not have ideal circumstances in life. And if his circumstances, where was Paul's joy found? If it wasn't in his circumstances, it was found in winning others to Christ. And if Paul's circumstances, if it promoted, let's go back to verse number 12, let's get verse number 12 back. If we see Paul, what he says here, he says that, the, uh, that his chains, his bonds, if all, of, all the things that happen unto me, he says the furtherance of the gospel. If what Paul goes through helps to promote and further the gospel, that was all that mattered to Paul. That word furtherance, here's what it means. Pioneer advance. Pioneer advance. It was a Greek military term that, that referred to the army engineers who would go before the troops to open up ways into new territories. And instead of Paul finding himself confined as a prisoner, he's writing this epistle while he's in chains. But rather than finding himself as a prisoner sitting there, Paul finds himself and discovers that his circumstances are opening up new areas of ministry that Paul maybe never would have experienced if it wouldn't been for the chains that he were in. And he says, all these things that happened unto me, it's okay because it's furthered. It is pioneer advancing. It is opening new territories for the gospel of Jesus Christ to spread into. So the circumstances in our lives, when we begin to view the bad things that happen to us that way as filtered by God, this is, this is instead, let's see how this can further the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul writes in the next chapter of 2 Corinthians, after he tells us a few of the bad things that happened to him, these things which happened unto me, here's what Paul says in the next chapter. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities and in reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. It was through the troubles through the valleys of life, that Paul grew. His faith grew. His power was magnified. His ministry flourished through the valley experiences rather than the mountaintop experiences. Someone once said, every irritation is an invitation to an elevation. God wants us to be pioneers. And sometimes he arranges circumstances so that we can be nothing else but pioneers. And in fact, that's how the gospel came to Philippi, the people that Paul are writing to. If you'll remember back, Paul wanted to go a different direction. Paul wanted to go into Asia. But God kept shutting the door. Paul couldn't get there. Paul kept shutting the door. 
Paul wanted to take the message eastward, but God wanted Paul to take the gospel westward and directed him into Europe. Just imagine the difference that it would have made if Paul would have forced his own way, if Paul would have done his own thing and gone east rather than going west. Just imagine the difference that the world would see today if Paul had done his own thing rather than allowing God's circumstances to cause Paul to be a pioneer to bring the gospel westward, eventually to Europe and eventually to England and to the, to the founding fathers that came over here and settled this country on the word of God. And then we see, man, we're, we're running out of time. We try to get all this in this morning. But Paul's trials, they produced a bigger and broader impact. Verse number 13, what does Paul say here? He says, My bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. You know, the Romans, they didn't realize that Paul's chains were actually releasing him rather than binding him and holding him back. Why? Because these chains that Paul had on, as a prisoner, they gave him contact with lost people. Paul was chained to a Roman soldier 24 hours a day. The shifts changed every six hours, which meant that Paul had a different soldier chained to him. He had four different people every single day. This was an elite guard of Roman soldiers, the Praetorian guard that he was chained to. There was like 16,000 troops in this. Four different ones every single day. Now, knowing what we know about Paul, do you think there was any chance that that Roman soldier that he was chained to didn't hear the gospel of Jesus Christ? And imagine being one of those Roman soldiers as you sit there chained to Paul as he writes these letters one after another to other churches and to other believers. And as, as his friends come to visit him, and as this man, as these soldiers, as they listen to Paul pray... You can't tell me that Paul did not influence the life of some of those Roman soldiers. That they began to trust Christ to save and they go home, maybe they tell their family about it and their lives begin to change. Man, he's getting the gospel. There's no way if Paul had gone to Rome as a preacher, this group of soldiers, they never would have listened to the message of Paul. The only way for Paul to get the message to these people was for him to be chained. And then to the palace, think about this. Paul wanted to get the message, the gospel of Jesus Christ into the palace. There probably wasn't going to be an open invitation for him to walk into the palace and preach the gospel. But now because he's in chains, he's going to go stand before Caesar in chains and plead his case for the defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Man, we talk about pioneer advancing these circumstances. People began to hear the gospel. A broader impact of Paul's life because of these bad things that happened. No one would choose for their little girl to be born deaf, but it was through that very case that the Bill Rice Ranch was born. At six weeks old, nobody would want their, their child to become blind, but Fanny Crosby at six weeks of age lost her eyesight. But rather than, than wallowing around in self-pity, she began to think about the love of God, and we know the impact that the ministry of Fanny Crosby's hymn writing has had for a long time now as we still sing those songs and find comfort. No one would choose to get cancer and lose an eye in the process of it, but it was because of that that God touched the heart of a man named Ron Hamilton and launched the Patch the Pirate ministry that's ministered to so many children and families and through Majesty Music today. It was because of that that we have that today. No one would choose for a missionary statesman like a man like Bob Hughes to come back from the mission field, but it was because of his circumstances that God touched the life of a man like Rick Martin, who's now gone on as a great missionary. If you find, a, I like this quote, if you find a path without obstacles, it probably leads nowhere. Very quickly, Paul's testimony produced a bolder inclination. Verse number 14, here's what he says. He says, many of my brethren... In the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. It's been said that the only Bible most people read are our lives. Paul alludes to this in the book of 2 Corinthians. He says, ye are our epistle written on our hearts, a letter, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. You know, it's often through trials that people watch us more closely. 
They want to see how we live and how we react when things get bad, when we go through rough patches, through rough circumstances. The writer of Hebrews, when we're going through that, I believe this was Paul again, here's what he instructs us to do. He says, look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, because he's our example. He says it was the joy of the cross that was set before him. Most of us look at the cross experience, the Calvary experience, and we think, man, what kind of joy could be found there? For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint of your minds. Enthusiasm begets enthusiasm. Zeal promotes zeal. Paul, because of his encouragement, because of his enthusiasm, in the last two verses that we read, he's telling the believers in Philippi, guess what? Because of what's happened to me and because of, because of my reaction to it, it, it's inspired the believers here in Rome. They've become more bold. They're sharing the gospel with other people. They took courage when they saw Paul's faith and determination. The believers in Rome, they got a little more bold and a little more confident. Because of Paul's joyful attitude, the believers in Rome took fresh courage and they witnessed for Christ. We're going to have to shut it down there for this morning. We've still got a little bit to go through. We'll get to it next Sunday. But as we leave off right there, I just kind of think about how our enthusiasm can inspire other people. You know, this last year we went to several Razorback basketball games. And things can be kind of dead in the arena. But then, you know, some play will happen and a few people get excited. And they'll get to screaming and yelling. And somebody down in the lower part of the arena, you know, they'll stand up and they'll try to get the rest of the crowd going. And a few more people will start to scream and yell. And before long, you've got 20,000 people in the arena that are screaming and yelling. I was going to put video in here and didn't get time to do it. But I can, I've got video of that very thing happening where enthusiasm promotes enthusiasm. Amen. And that's what Paul's saying. He's, saying he, he's telling these believers, look, because of my circumstances... Because of Paul's attitude toward his circumstances. Paul could have taken a different attitude, couldn't he? Paul could have looked at his problems rather than the possibilities. And that difference encourages all these believers in Rome. They began to stand up and they began to share the gospel. And again, the gospel spreads. And it goes further west and further west and further west. And we have the gospel today. Maybe because Paul took the right attitude to the problems and the circumstances that he faced. We'll pick up there next week as we look at the rest of Philippians chapter 1. But we would talk about finding joy, always rejoicing in circumstances. Let's choose to filter those circumstances as God given to us when bad things happen. Let's understand that mountaintop experiences... Don't create a lot of growth. Valley experiences do. We choose to thank God for it because it will help to further the gospel if we allow it. Lord, thank you for this morning as we read through the book of Philippians, as we study Paul's encouragement to us. Lord, I pray that you'd help us this morning to make the decision to view circumstances as a blessing, as a possibility to pioneer advance, to further the gospel message of Christ. Lord, I pray that you'd prepare our hearts now as we move into the morning worship hour, that we would sing this morning from our hearts, that we would give you the praise and glory from our lips, the fruit of our lips this morning, Lord, and that we would have open ears and open hearts and open minds as we hear the preaching of the Word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.